I'm really delighted to be joined by Terry Cannon today. Um, Terry uh, went to UCLA and then Loyola Law School, um, was involved in helping many, many institutions become accredited, uh, was the dean of two law schools, has published three books, uh, and then uh, spent uh, 10 illustrious years at one of the most innovative universities uh, in the United States, Minerva University. Um, Terry, it's a real pleasure. Thanks, Josh. I'm happy to be here with you today. Um, tell me about the roles that you had at Minerva. Um, you've been with them since the very early days, mm -hmm. um, you know, a, at least a decade there. What have you um, done in that institution? Because you've really helped architect uh, who they've become from an accreditation perspective. And I skipped over it, but you are also executive vice president at uh, what I anecdotally call WASC, um, but you can correct to their, their proper legal name. Thanks. Thanks. So at Minerva, I have had the honor of working there since the very beginning. I was about the fourth person to come onto the payroll. So initially it was Ben Nelson and three engineers and then me. So I was the first academic. And uh, I started there because I, I met Ben Nelson, who was trying to figure out how to get Minerva accredited before he had graduates, which is a prerequisite to regional accreditation. We can talk about that more later if you would like. Um, and so I met him and then helped to develop what the model would look like over time. So I was the one who knew what a traditional accredited institution had to look like in order to get and keep that accreditation. So we created Minerva University to meet those expectations from the very beginning. Uh, and we hired within uh, months of my being retained, Stephen Coslin, who was the initial dean. I know that you know him very well. And, and he also is interested in what you're doing at Wolf. Um, and he helped, he, we worked very closely to, together on the curriculum, the assessment methods, et cetera. Um, and, and what we did in those first few years was to figure out first um, how we could fulfill our mission, which is nurturing critical wisdom for the sake of the world. We really took that very seriously. We wanted to create this group of of leaders, entrepreneurs, problem solvers, who would have the intellectual skills and the global perspective to solve the world's biggest problems. A very audacious and bold uh, goal. Uh, and we tried to create a curriculum that would do that. Um, one thing I know you talk about on your website and we were talking about at the time was, how do we prepare people for jobs and for a world that we don't even know what those jobs are going to be yet. We couldn't even name them. We don't know what the world is going to look like when these young people are 20 years into their lives and careers after school. So we tried to identify um, the intellectual skills they would need for a lifetime, critical thinking, creative thinking, effective interaction, and effective communication. And then we built those out with Stephen's leadership. We developed the competencies and subcompetencies that would go along with that. And instead of creating a, a general education program that focused on subject matter, we focused on the development of intellectual skills hmm. and then built out the rest of the curriculum and then also built out the global aspect of it, the um, the teaching and learning model, which is very, very different, technology enhanced, but built in the science of learning. So we were sitting next to engineers creating the Minerva project platform that builds into it all the best learning strategies. And, and we should pause for, for people that don't know, what is the general shape of Minerva? Because it's unusual, right? Where, where students come in and actually spend time in multiple countries, during their undergraduate degree. Walk us through that a little bit. Why did you choose to do it that way as an organization? And, and what's the kind of goal of, of that? Well, you know, the, the goal fits the mission, nurturing critical wisdom for the sake of the world. We sought out from the very beginning to have a global student body 
because we see that global problems have to be solved with a global perspective, global understanding, global competencies. So we tried to create a global student body. We did. We have students and alumni from 89 different countries, and we have a globally diverse workforce, our faculty and staff. We also wanted them to experience multiple countries and not to stay cloistered in one place for four years. So the first year students are in residence in San Francisco, and then they travel to six other countries before they return to do their capstone experience after the end of their uh, last semester abroad. And we selected those countries very carefully, those cities to be vibrant, exciting, on the upswing, emerging and really developed economies um, and countries that would give students many different perspectives, a couple in Asia, a couple, of, you know, UK and Berlin, uh, South America, um, India. So we wanted our students to have that kind of exposure. And we focus very much on applied and experiential learning. So what, in addition to their classroom learning, which is, I can go back to and talk about more too, that enables this, which is enhanced with technology and they take it online, the students are applying what they're learning in projects on the ground in every city. They do civic projects, they do volunteer work, they do location-based assignments. So they're seeing, for example, the issue of sustainability in seven different countries and how seven different cities and countries handle those challenges and how and the commonality and the uniqueness of those challenges as they present in each country gives them a completely different worldview as they step out into the world when they graduate. Let's take a step back. So I, I'm a student at Minerva. I'm going to travel first to San Francisco. I'm kind of, I'm a global student, so this is new for me going to San Francisco. And then I'm going to go to, to six other countries. And then I'm going to travel to those countries with my classmates. Are the teachers coming along? Because there's a whole technology aspect here. How does that work? Yeah, so the faculty do not travel with the students. The students travel as a cohort of about 150 to each of the countries. They all live together in shared housing. They're in dorm-like facilities or apartments, whatever is appropriate uh, for the location that they're in, but together. There are local staff on the ground that help them to do the cultural immersion and the projects in the cities. The faculty are teaching their courses on our technology platform, which is a video-based, uh, very uh, highly sophisticated system that has built into it all of the best strategies for learning, but also all of the assessment, all of the formative assessment that reports back to students on their dashboards, et cetera. So it's a, a highly evolved system and the classes are small. There are only, um, there's a maximum of 20 in a class, 15 to 20. So the students are super engaged in class, flip classroom, prepare ahead of time, take quizzes or polls and participate together in groups in class, uh, solving problems, applying what they're learning. And that enables them to go on this global rotation, have the stability of this curriculum and full-time, highly skilled, uh, really prominent faculty members teaching them um, at the same time they're having the global rotation. And then a few faculty members and members of the administration, the deans, will visit each city when the students are there and engage with them. Um, and so they, they see us in person. During COVID, that, that part was hard, but now they see us again uh, in person in all the cities. Hmm. Uh, it's, it's really incredible. What led to the, the vision of, of traveling like this during the degree? I, I don't know of any other institution that takes travel quite so seriously as core to the curriculum. Um, it, it's, it's incredible. I'm curious how you got there. I'm also curious what the regulatory reaction was to that because it sounds a little outside the box. It is outside the box. We don't know anybody else that's doing it. There's a lot of interest in it. And it's one of the things that has so much appeal to prospective students. Uh, 
they want to be in a global student body and they want to have that global experience. They want to see themselves as part as global citizens and part of the world. I think what led to that is that we really do believe that people learn by doing and they learn by experiencing. They don't learn by listening to lectures. They don't learn by taking time tests. Mm. They learn by their own experience. And we couldn't give them that global experience without doing something like we're doing. And we didn't want it to be narrow. We didn't want it to be typical study abroad where the students all stick together and don't have the deep yeah. cultural immersion. At the same time, we wanted them to be able to get the consistent quality instruction and curriculum throughout their four years have that stability of all of those same 60 faculty members teaching them through the four years. So the, the, how do you integrate the local environment then into it? Is it that, you know, you, because they're not just there to have fun with, with their friends, right? Because they're traveling around the world. They could do that in summers in between semesters or, or something like this. Yeah. Um, instead of actually doing it during the semester. What's the argument for doing it during the semester? So uh, we we do it in a number of ways in order for students to really optimize the experience. Uh, we have, as I mentioned, student life staff on the ground that are all local. And we try to have the same people in each city year after year, semester after semester, when we go back to that city. We develop relationships with civic partners, which could be government, private organizations, NGOs in those cities that will sponsor projects our students can work on. We have cultural immersion activities that prepare students before they go and that they take part in while they're there. There are multiple activities every week for them. And then in their classes, going back to this idea of problem solving across the world, each of their courses, and they're taking three or four a semester, has a location-based assignment that connects to what they're learning in class. So like a sustainability issue, since I brought that up before, yeah. we have, and we have so many students interested in climate change and solving those problems. So they'll do, in India, they'll talk about sustainable agriculture and they'll go out to a farm. You know, they've done similar things in South America when they're in Argentina. Um, so that's that's what it looks like on the ground. They're doing something uh, nearly every day outside of class that connects them with people, organizations, and the challenges faced in those cities. It sounds, um, you know, you were involved uh, in student affairs. It sounds complicated, right? <laughs> Um, it's it very complicated yeah. all over the world. Um, it was an incredibly rich experience. Um, what was it like for the student body and having to manage some of the challenges that would arise in that environment? What was your role in that? And, you know, there are a lot of unique circumstances. I mean, students, you know, are, are young and they get in trouble and they, they do things and stuff happens. Um, and that's all, you know, in the American context, often in a campus environment. Um, less frequently in, in, say, Europe, where it might be embedded in a city. What was it like for these students, you know, traveling across multiple countries? Um, well, first of all, at the end of the day, they absolutely love their four-year experience. Yeah. And that includes going back to the first graduating class, which didn't have the same quality of experience that the students get now because we were just learning some of what yeah. you were alluding to like what what kind of problems are they going to encounter yeah. um, what do we need to do to prepare them and support them and over the course of our first now eight years we have really evolved iterated on and developed yeah. a system that works so that uh, we have the right staff on the ground providing them with the right support. We have the right preparation for them so that they can optimize these four month time frames in which they're there. Um, and, and we have the right a set of kind of cultural values and rules that we expect them to meet. If they can't meet those, um, we find out in the first year when they're in San Francisco, when yep, they're yep. first year students, and then we're able to counsel and work with them, or they might decide that they're going to leave, yep. um, or 
you know, most of the time students stay, we have a more than 90% retention rate because we're so careful about how we pick them, which is another element of it. We try to yeah. pick students that have grit, that are adaptable, that are resilient. And then um, we have something we call integrated learning outcomes, which have to do with the growth and development we expect of them in school. And it helps to prepare them for the global rotation. So one of those integrated learning outcomes is self-management wellness. So in the first semester, we focus on helping them to learn how to take care of themselves. We don't have a meal plan. They have to cook in a communal kitchen, figure out how to cook, where to buy their food, yeah. Um, they're held to very high standards in terms of their conduct. There's, you know, no drinking in the residence halls. If they, mm -hmm. if they act out, they get called on it right away. And um, generally, because of the quality of students we get, yeah. those issues are worked out pretty well within the first year. Mm -hmm. um, but it is a complex thing that we're doing takes a lot of very dedicated people and a lot of logistical complexity that we're dealing yeah. with day in and day out. We have, you know, mental health professionals they can access 24-7. Um, we have, you know, staff that live with them in each of the places where yeah. they're living. So they get a lot of support. And I should mention, um, one of the things I, I've really admired about Minerva is precisely the graduates. Uh, the graduates that I know are from the very early classes. Um, and many of them have this uh, perspective of, of having co-created Minerva as they were going through it. Um, and I know some of them because, you know, Wolf University is involved in the ed tech scene. And right. um, we come across lots of people from Minerva who were formerly students and have now graduated many years yeah. later. And it's always really impressive to see how they dealt with their student experience as something that they were helping to create as a kind of adventure of very high quality people uh, working on something innovative and, you know, now have kind of a passion for ed tech um, as an industry. So really interesting to see. Um, how do, how has it gone, you know, what, what's been the regulatory journey uh, that you've been on? Say a little bit about the work that you've done on the side of the fence as a regulator, but then also um, switching sides of the fence and, and bringing Minerva through the regulatory process. Sure, sure. So um, I started out doing accreditation work as a peer reviewer in the 1970s. And I've worked on the staff as either a consultant or a vice president in four different accrediting agencies or, or actually a commission member in four different agencies. And uh, right before I came to Minerva, I was with WASC, which is the Western Association of Schools and Colleges which has three commissions. And I work for the Senior College and University Commission, which is four-year colleges and above. Um, and as the executive vice president, I was the one who also as a lawyer was the one who was looking at new things that were coming down the track uh, toward us as accreditors going on in higher education and really paid a lot of attention to innovation and how um, accreditation needed to adapt. There was a great deal of mismatch between what was going on outside of traditional higher education and accreditation, and that was fairly obvious. One of the things I mentioned earlier was that, um, you know, we to get regional accreditation, an institution has to have graduates. If you're running a four-year program without accreditation for four years before you can even apply for accreditation, it's going to be hard for you to stay alive economically or in terms of enrolling yeah. really good qualified students and faculty. And, and so that's why we approached it differently when we started Minerva. Mm -hmm. um, I would say also that accreditors not only have their own very entrenched rules and regulations to deal with, but they're controlled by the Department of Education in the U.S., which is another whole layer of regulations that they have to keep, whether they'd like them or not. Um, and an example of that that you and I have talked about a little bit is the way that the Department of Education treats and views distance education using a definition of 
student and faculty aren't in the same room together, it's distance education and therefore requires a higher level of scrutiny um, and oversight. So, uh, you know, the other thing is that, that I should mention is that in addition to having to wait till you have graduates, it then may take a year or two to get candidacy for accreditation and then up to another five years before an institution is fully accredited. Yeah. So the system is slow. It's, uh, it's a good quality assurance system, but it's not perfect and it's not designed for things that uh, need to be done right away in order to adapt to needs of prospective students, needs of the economy, needs of the corporate world, employment needs out, out in the world. Um, so I was there for six and a half years. And then on my on the last day that I was working in accreditation, Ben Nelson, the founder of Minerva, came into Minerva and someone told him, you need to talk to her because she can help you get accredited. Um, and then the way that we did that was that we created an incubation model. Mm -hmm. So we knew we wanted to be highly selective and get really qualified students because yeah. we're talking about the Olympic athletes of higher education, right? So we knew that we needed to be accredited to attract those students and also attract the amazing faculty that we've been able to draw to Minerva. And we couldn't do it as an unaccredited entity. Yeah. So we decided to partner with Keck Graduate Institute, which is um, a graduate only member of the Claremont Colleges, the seven okay. very prestigious Claremont Colleges in Southern California. Keck was the newest of the seven, very entrepreneurial itself very focused on a lot of the same things that we were, active learning, use of technology, preparing people for life skills and jobs on top of giving them the intellectual backbone to do all of that. And they loved what we were doing and they created Minerva Schools at KGI, which was a a place on their org chart with their other mm -hmm. at the time two schools yep. and they exercised oversight of us until we became accredited on our own so from 2013 to to 2000 mid-year 21 um, they were our board they were our president uh, we worked with their faculty I was on several committees there uh, and they were our partner and then we went out a couple of years prior to that when we were eligible since we had graduates and applied for and got accreditation on our first visit. Yeah, it's really just fantastic. Um, it's a long journey. It's a, a deep, deep investment to make. Um, we, you know, in the United States context, it's relatively clear that accreditation is tied to funding and loans and so on for US students. We have a very international student base. And so setting aside the, the question of US government support, why should I as a student, maybe coming from abroad, care that the institution is accredited? Um, let me say one thing before I answer that directly, and that is that Minerva didn't do this for our financial aid. We do not use Title IV funding from the US government. Um, and we only have right now about 12% US students. There's yeah. no country that dominates. So. The reason that someone should care about accreditation with a small a, because yeah. I'm not mandating any particular kind of accreditation, is that uh, it's a quality assurance process. And what you do at Wolf is very, very rigorous. Um, and what, what WASC and most other accreditors do is too. Um, not all of them, some of them have failed and not done a good job, but you know, consumers, deserve to know that the education that they're getting and paying for and and banking on to provide them a better life in whatever yeah. way that looks like for them they deserve to know what they're going to get what they're going to learn what they're going to know and be able to do um, and make an assessment of whether that's worth the money and the effort so yeah. that they're getting a return on the investment uh, that they need and this is an issue in higher ed right now because there are so many new players 
providing different kinds of education and training opportunities that don't have a natural place to get that quality assurance applied to them. Mm. So it's a little bit of a wild west. Um, and that's one of the reasons why what you're doing and others are doing in trying to create new accrediting agencies and ways of getting uh, formal quality assurance is, is very, it's very heartening to know that there are efforts out there to do that. Um, my, my understanding is that, you know, there's, there's a huge kind of learning curve that an institution goes through the first time they become accredited. And that really does increase the quality. And then there's this fairly heavy burden of ongoing monitoring and, and quality assurance that follows thereafter, um, which also increases and maintains the quality of what's happening. Um, sometimes there, there are rules that come with that that can be harder for some organizations because they maybe are more opinionated about what needs to happen during the learner's journey. Um, I, I think probably general education requirements is an example of that. Um, so there's a proliferation of boot camps that are very highly specialized. In some cases, they're doing really advanced um, computer science studies or, or things like this, but they definitely don't have gen eds, for example. Um, you know, what's, what's the role of, of this kind of burgeoning gray area where many people are spending a lot of their time learning outside the formally accredited environment now, doing things like boot camps? And then there are real constraints on the accredited space um, to offer programs without gen eds, for example. Um, do, do you have like a view on how opinionated regulators should be about some of those things? Like gen eds are really good for uh, forming people who are going to be good members of society, for example, and, and have a kind of a general perspective on the world. Um, but maybe not everybody needs that or wants that. Um, like should regulators be quite so opinionated? Um, you know, yes and no. So first of all, let me make a defense of good general education. Yep. So and and this is a this is a workforce defense I will say. Yeah. So I've done um, some a lot of research recently into what are the intellectual skills that people need to have to be successful, not just now, but you know, yeah. in the in the current fourth industrial revolution and going into the yeah. fifth. The World Economic Forum published a list of the ten top skills people need to be successful in the world. Um, Having specific technology skills was not one of the things they yep. Yeah. It's it's creativity, it's problem solving, judgment, working on a team, um, being you know being adaptable and resilient, having a global perspective, having being able to work on a diverse team. Those are the things that they named. So I think that um, not everybody has to want or need those, but that's why a bachelor's degree in particular focuses yeah, on yeah. those because that's part of what a bachelor's degree represents to the world is that this person is broadly educated. They're going to be able to work in an interdisciplinary environment. They're going to have creative skills and critical thinking skills and not just purely technical skills. They get technical or more specific skills in their majors and the minors and the electives they take, but they need to have that general education. I don't think you have to have that for every certificate or every associate's degree at the same depth that you would for a bachelor's degree. Yeah. Or do I think everybody has to take everything in a particular order? Um, and so I think an on-ramp for somebody to work in tech, make good money, be able yeah. to upskill over time, and maybe aggregate enough credits, including the general education to end up earning a degree. That's kind of one way to do it. Yeah, I yeah. think a creditor should not be dictating the content of the general education. Um, so I know a lot of accrediting agencies dictate, you've got to have English, you've got to have civics, you've got to have science you've, and Minerva's, model is not that it's more what i said you have to have these you have to know these 80 habits of mind and foundational concepts that are in those four big buckets that i named yeah and not one of them has a label on it that says i am science 
Yeah. I am mathematics, but they're all embedded deeply into the intellectual skills that are on that list. You know, um, I've spent my professional career outside the United States for the most part and, and on faculty at Oxford and the University of Edinburgh, um, both institutions that don't have any general education requirements. And so the students um, end up being very, very specialized. And so I'd often have American students coming in their second year um, joining the classroom with uh, European and British students. And, um, you know, my anecdotal observation, of course, is that the Americans had a lot more to say about a lot of things, and many of them had completed a, their, their gen eds, right? And yeah. so they, they had a pretty broad perspective on things. They were not nearly as specialized going into their special second year as, say, the, the British and European students, who had yeah. maybe even begun specializing in, you know, the last year of high school. Um, and so by the time they finish a, a three-year undergraduate degree, they actually know more about a, a given topic that they've specialized in than somebody doing a four-year um, undergraduate degree in the United States, but they don't have the, the general education piece in place. Uh, it's an interesting trade-off, right? So if you're just learning totally, yeah. skills, um, you know, they're going to expire. Um, and so what's the balance between kind of long-term learning, uh, you know, an education that's going to serve somebody throughout their life? Um, and in kind of short term, this, this is how you, you know, deploy some JavaScript or something like that. Yeah, and the other, the other aspect of that is because of the emphasis in the US on this general ed, plus then having a major, is that it's pretty hard to get a four-year degree in less than four years. There are three-year degree programs and there's competency-based education and ways you can do that now, but it does take less time if you don't include all of that. So you're out in the economy, earning a living, participating as a, as a citizen um, earlier if you don't have uh, that part of the degree embedded in what you're studying. It, it's true. You know, both, both Cambridge and Oxford who practice this um, give all of their students an upgrade from a bachelor's degree to a master's degree on their fifth anniversary of graduation. <laughs> I'm not sure that they they merited it, but it's a, it's a good... Uh, excuse to come back and celebrate with former classmates. Oh, um, that's interesting. Yeah. Terry, you're you're right at the cutting edge of, of many of the relationships between regulation and innovation. Where do you think we're going to be in 10 years? Uh, what an interesting question. Well, I think we, I hope and think that we're going to have um, more quality assurance agencies that understand and are more amenable to the new kinds of programs that are giving people opportunities to learn and to upskill and to learn and earn and do apprenticeships and boot camps and all of those things that haven't fit neatly into the box of traditional higher education. So I see a number of efforts, including organizations like Wolf, that also attempts to create new accrediting agencies, quality assurance groups, um, and I hope that they're all firmly part of this great system that we have of many different ways to enter and get a higher education and benefit for your life after that and benefit for the economy and the world. So that's what I would like to see. I would also, I would also hope that um, that we do become more global in our perspective about yeah. what we're teaching, how we're teaching it, who we're teaching. You, we see a lot of movement with global campuses across the world. Um, up until the last couple of years with COVID, many more institutions were trying to internationalize. They yep. had something in their mission statement or their strategic plan about, about that, either bringing students here or having study abroad. I hope that that continues because I really do believe even more now that I've seen uh, what our alumni can do and what's going on in the world, that uh, that global perspective is how we're going to make the world a better place. Mm -hmm. um, big problems get solved by groups of diverse people from different places coming together um, and having different perspectives and creative approaches to problem solving. So I hope to see more of that too in the next decade. But I certainly think students are going to be more mobile. I, I have to agree on that one. Of course, um, Wolf's mission is to make world-class higher education more accessible uh, and to ensure that the credits are, are globally recognized. And, and that involves a lot of complicated work under the hood. Um, Terry, it's a real pleasure. Thanks so much for taking the time. 
um, you know, I'm delighted to have been able to learn a bit more about what you've been up to. Thanks, Josh. It was really a lot of fun talking with you. Take care.